You know something? For me, this is the best day of the year. Christmas is great. But there are a lot of things take. Today, everything is real. Everything we look at today, everything we celebrate, shut up you, is <laughs> real. It's real. There's nothing made up, nothing, just imagination or fantasy. It's all real. And this is the day Jesus won the victory over Satan. But you know, that, like so many parts of the Bible, the story of Easter originates in the Garden of Eden. Just wait for you to say something there. Oh, we're in the Garden again. <laughs> okay. Um, we're in the Garden again. It's surprising of, of, of how so much what the Bible tells us actually originates there. But it's true. It's sure that God first told Satan he would send his champion, in my words, to beat him into the ground and crush his head. Satan did everything he could to stop this happening. Well, <coughs> after God confronted Adam and Eve about their disobedience, God confronted Satan with the part he played. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put en enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, Satan's not stupid. Yeah, he does stupid things from time to time, such as trying to overthrow God, but don't ever under underestimate his supernatural intelligence. He knew full well who God was talking about. He knew that one day Jesus would arrive and Jesus would defeat him. Now, <coughs> well, Satan is an expert in spiritual law. And he almost certainly knew the only way he would be defeated is if God himself came sacrificed himself and took our punishment, took the punishment for our sins on himself. God did come and sacrifice himself in the person of Jesus. Later on, Isaiah also prophesied that Jesus would come. In Isaiah 9, chapter 6, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and to us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The words, <coughs> the words government shall be upon his shoulder tell us that he will defeat Satan and take back the world that he himself created, that he will be the ruler once again. So Satan knew who was coming and he worked out a plan to stop Jesus succeeding in his mission to defeat Satan and to redeem mankind from his, his dirty, grubby, disgusting, vile, sordid clutches. Like I said earlier, I hate Satan. I can't put enough words to that thing. And um, Jesus lived his whole life with the intention of going to the cross. It's the reason he was born in the first place. People often believe that Jesus was killed. No, he wasn't. Nobody took his life from him. He laid it down. There was nothing Satan could do to stop Jesus laying his life down for us. No matter how hard he tried and made no mistake about it, he did. John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. Therefore, my father loves me, 
because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command have I received from my Father. Even though Satan knew this, he never gives up. He tried to kill Jesus when Jesus was very young. King Herod ordered the slaughter of all boys two years old and under in the area of Bethlehem. Matthew 2, verses 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, <coughs> from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Of course, an angel of God had warned Joseph in a dream to take Mary and the baby Jesus to Egypt before the slaughter took place. They'd gone, they'd escaped. And now Satan failed. I like that part. I love to emphasize his failures. His next attempt came when Jesus had been led into the desert by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan. But in his usual deviousness, he waited till Jesus had fasted 40 days so he was at his weakest, both physically and mentally. Then Satan came to Jesus to tempt him three times. Jesus quoted the scriptures to Satan. And Satan couldn't stand against God's word. But it's interesting to note we have a situation where Jesus, who is the living word of God, was being tempted by Satan and was quoting the written word of God. So the word of God was coming at him twice. It's no wonder Satan had no chance of standing up to Jesus. So off he went to wait until a better opportunity arose to stop Jesus going to the cross. So if we look at the third temptation that Satan gave, it was at least on the face of it an easy way out to Jesus. It was a bona fide offer, at least that's what Satan made out. It was an easy way to avoid the cross. Matthew 4, verses 8 to 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The Satan did indeed have the power to give the whole world to Jesus, to Jesus because Adam and Eve had given this power to, to Satan. Jesus actually accepted that Satan had the power to make this offer, he never disputed it. But Jesus would never have worshipped Satan, come what may, so right through the offer. If he worshipped Satan, he'd have made the same mistake Adam made in the garden. Adam blamed Eve for his eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Eve blamed the serpent and Satan in disguise. That way, Satan gained Adam's authority. If Jesus had bowed and worshipped Satan, he would have handed his own authority over to Satan. And because he would have placed Satan in a higher position than himself. Because you can't worship anybody that's in a lower position than you are. And what's more, being the lying, cheating, con man he is, Satan wouldn't have given the word to Jesus anyway. He would never have kept his word. He'd have just gladly taken Jesus' authority and laughed as he walked away. But the third attempt by Satan stopped Jesus was when Jesus had told the disciples he was going to be betrayed and he was going to die. Peter took him to one side and began to rebuke him. 
Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So Satan tried three times to stop Jesus going to the cross, because he knew it would be the end for him. <coughs> he would be defeated once and for all. Now, when demons have been interrogated, during a deliverance session, they stated that before Jesus died, they had things pretty much sewn up. But after he died, it all fell to pieces. They say now they're facing opposition like they've never faced before. It's all down to Jesus laying his life down on the cross for us. You might think, well, Jesus went to the cross, yeah, but he's God. It was nothing for God to handle. Who I was on the cross, then he died. Ah, that's easy for God. He can deal with that, no big deal. That's not true. It took a lot of courage. Only people who have to say, I'll give myself up, I'll hang on that cross. Anybody here just do it? No. Any offers? Exactly. It takes a lot to lay down your life on the cross for somebody else to do you see, as God, the cross was nothing. You can handle that quite easily. When Jesus came to earth, he had to clear himself of all his supernatural abilities on a temporary basis because he had to become just a normal human being to lead the way for us. He had to depend on the Holy Spirit and live a perfect, pure and holy life to make a way that we could follow. It took Jesus laying down his life on the cross and taking our punishment in our place to make a way back to the Father for us. And Jesus had the same human weaknesses and frailties that we had, that we still have. He was scared of the agonizing death he knew awaited him only a few days ahead when he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. People were placing palm leaves in front of the donkey as he rode in. But Jesus knew that within a few days, these very same people would be calling for him to be crucified because they'd expected him to lead a rebellion against Rome. But that wasn't why Jesus came. So he turned on him and called for his crucifixion. Can you imagine how Jesus must have felt when all this was going on? Looking at the people, so Hosanna, Hosanna, highest way, Messiah. And then, well, no, when a few days later, they're going to be shouting, Kill him, kill him, crucify him. Makes you wonder if, as he's up on the cross looking down, he recognized any of the faces from a few days before. So Jesus rode to Jerusalem on a donkey to fulfill the prophecy given by Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem Behold, your king is coming to you He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey a colt, the foal of a donkey Luke chapter 23, verse 21. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! What a turnaround then. It's interesting to note two things. First, that Jesus rode to his birth on a donkey and to his death on a donkey. The, the donkey is the only animal born with a cross imprinted on his fur. If you look at the colour of a, a donkey's back, there's a cross on the donkey. So, 
Maybe it's a reward from God for the service it gave to Jesus. Who knows? On the donkey's shoulder. On his yeah. mane. From his mane across his shoulder. Yeah. So have a look at the photo of it. The only animal. The only certain, new, certain donkey was. was yeah. And second here, when Jesus was laid in the tomb, it was a tomb which had never been used by anybody else before Jesus was laid there. So he was conceived in a virgin womb and laid in a virgin tomb. Both perfect, pure, never used before. So, as later on then, we know that Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Luke 22 verses 47 48. This was taking place while Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? So then Jesus went through a totally illegal and fake trial and was sentenced to crucifixion. This trial took place overnight. It wasn't supposed to. That was illegal in the Jewish law. I won't go, I won't go through things in detail today, but what Jesus went through on that cross was far more than most people realise or even imagine. The Romans had crucifixion worked out to an art. They perfected it. They knew how to make the victim linger on without dying. And it was, it was, it was in clear agony. So onlookers could look and it would serve as an example to anyone who decided to rebel against Rome. Now the nails were about nine inches long and about an inch thick and as they were hammered into the victim they were placed in the areas where either they would cut the nerve which would have been about there or next to the nerve so that as the victim pulled themselves up <coughs> they'd either have to pull themselves up and that nerve that nail would touch a nerve that had been snapped by the nail going through or the nerve was rubbing up and down against the nail. And the, the victim would be in excruciating pain. They wouldn't be able to breathe properly. So as long as they were hanging on that cross like that, they were suffocated. Each body organ would be shutting down. So they'd be sending pain signals to the brain, which meant that Jesus' entire body was in pain all through the crucifixion. During the six hours he was on the cross, he probably had about five or six strokes, maybe the same number of heart attacks, his lungs filled up with water, which meant he couldn't breathe. And this was on top of the loss of blood from the scourging he suffered before the crucifixion took place. He was chained to a wooden post like that, and there was a whip with about six, maybe nine, or a cat of nine tails you could call it. And these were designed, each time the person was whipped, to pull out the muscles, tendons and sinews from the victim's body. And they would go to the point where you could see the victim's spine, and very often you could see their lungs breathing in and out. And that was on top of all the lo uh, loss of blood, and carrying the beam of the cross to wherever they were going to be crucified. This wasn't the worst thing Jesus went through. The worst thing was his father had to reject him when he's going through all this torment, suffering and pain. Jesus had to face the rejection that we would have had to have gone through had he not died for us. Matthew 27 verse 46 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. That's what you plan to say? Yes. I'm getting good. <laughs> that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus had never <coughs> been rejected or separated from his Father in all eternity. So this was a new experience for Jesus. One that we should have had to have faced. But Jesus saved us from that. And after about six hours, the task of paying for our sins was completed. So Jesus declared, it is finished. And gave up his life. Nobody took it from him. He decided the moment when he would die had arrived. He'd done the job. Now it's a case of let's get off the cross. And who can blame him? He was in agony. More than we'll ever understand. Because when he was on that cross, he had to take the punishment that each one of us would have taken had we gone to hell. He took it on himself. And that took some doing. John chapter 19, verse 13. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I'll tell you a story now, which I believe to be true. It's when I, I heard about it, I put it to the test. And I sometimes interrogate demons, and they have confirmed this while under interrogation and getting very, very stressed. After, in between Jesus dying and rising again, a demon remembered that Jesus said he'd rise on the third day. So in an effort to prevent Jesus coming out of the tomb, every demon went to the tomb, said that himself was there, and they were all pushing against the stone to stop it being rolled away. Then came down two angels, and one just rolled it away effortlessly against the combined power of Satan and every demon. They, and to this day, they are angry and they are miffed about it. Sometimes they just say, ah, I took two angels to push that stone away, and all of us couldn't stop it. Oh, they're not happy. But better still, so when Jesus walked out of that tomb in his glorious resurrected body, they all went back about 40 feet. Every one of them fell backwards. And I can say that they could not stand in the presence of the resurrected, glorified Jesus. And to think they wanted to overthrow him. They couldn't even stand in his presence. <laughs> it's a pathetic joke. You see. This is not the end of the story because Jesus went back up to heaven and he's been working hard preparing a place for each of us. He wants to spend eternity with us. I remember Jesus went through all this for all, for all of us out of his love for us. Jesus bought eternal life for us, the price being the shedding of his blood, a high price which he thought worth paying for you. And Jesus will be coming back very, very soon. And all the signs are there. The end time prophecies are falling into place. So are you ready? Whenever Jesus comes back, you don't know the hour, minute, second, it's not going to be long. What will you say when you stand before him and he asks you, what did you do with the life I gave you? What did you do with the gifts I gave you? Did you respond to the calling I had for your life? Will he say, well done? good and faithful servant, or not. So, uh, would everybody like to join me in this prayer, please? Lord Jesus, I can't thank you enough 
for giving up everything for me. You gave up your place in heaven and your nature as God. You were betrayed. You were abandoned by your own father. You went through horrendous pain and torment. And you did it for me. Very soon you are coming back. Please help me to be ready for you and to respond to whatever calling you have on my life. I am here, ready to serve you in any way you ask. In Jesus' name, Amen.